thanks to our audience. Uh, all of you were here in presence and uh, those many more are following us online. And a warm welcome to our guest, Alex Stubb. So, as Sandra said uh, before the break, you are the director of the School of Transnational Governance and former Prime Minister of uh, Finland. But, of course, you have been also Minister for Finance, for Foreign Affairs, for European Affairs and Trade, uh, the leader of your own party, uh, member of European Parliament, member of the Finnish Parliament, and finally, Vice President of the European Investment Bank before you joined the School for uh, Transnational Governance around three years ago. And so basically you went back to where you came from, right? Because at the beginning, before entering politics, you were a researcher, you were an expert on new affairs, you were a lecturer at the College of Europe, and now basically you are bringing all this background together uh, in your new book that you're writing, The New World Disorder, in which you combine a bit of practical experience and theory, personal and academic perspective, real-life anecdotes, and a very structured uh, analysis. Uh, by three, three right? <laughs> three parts, three chapters, three uh, theses. This is your trademark. Uh, so basically, you presented these uh, three theses in one of your uh, Geopolitics with Alex lesson. Uh, love the name, by the way. And so I thought that this could be a good starting point, right? Sure. For, for this discussion, to try to understand this world of disorder and maybe suggest some strategies to bring back some order? Sure. Okay, so first of all, you know this topical debate between multipolar and bipolar system. Your first thesis in this book is that we are heading more and more toward a multipolar system with three main uh, power centers, sure. Europe, China, yeah. and the US, and the whole array of uh, challenger, let's say. What do you think are the challenges and the opportunities for the EU in this new system? Well, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, I think, you know, we are at an EIF, so I probably shouldn't begin quoting Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> but, you know, Vladimir Lenin allegedly said that there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I, I feel that we're very much in one of those junctures in history. And I, I think for our generation and for us in Europe, this is our 1918, 1945 or 1989 moment when, when something big is happening. Of course, in this particular case, it was ignited by Putin's and Russia's attack on, on Ukraine. Uh, but in 1918, they got it wrong. I mean, the League of Nations was a nice idea, but it failed. Uh, in 1945, they got it right. The world became bipolar. We had the UN and the rules-based system that guarded peace. And in 1989, we all thought that you know history ended. Uh, and to a certain extent, in Europe, it did until Russia attacked. What's Europe's role in all of this? I think we have to understand that the world is changing, which basically means that the way in which I've described it is that we have three spheres of power. One is the global west, that's us, uh, with the US and Canada, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Australia. We want to preserve the current world order. Why? Because we created it and it benefits us. We're roughly 50 states. Then there's the global we east, which is about 25 countries. It's led by China. Uh, followed by Russia, Iran, and 22 countries that vote with them in the UN. Uh, China, of course, is very strategic. It's very patient. It's very intelligent. Since it started opening in 78, it's been basically creating path dependencies with the rest of the world. It is now the biggest creditor of 120 countries in the world. On top of that, uh, it is the biggest provider of infrastructure or, uh, and raw materials around the world. Russia is a disruptive power. Uh, it's sort of a, a superpower in decline, and you can see that in its behavior. And then, of course, Iran and the rest. But they, they want to change it. They want to change the order because they don't feel it benefits them. 
and to a certain extent, Russia su succeeded in, in enforcing that change. But the one that's going to decide the new world order, I think it's a global south, and I know it's a very big term, but 125 countries led in Asia by India, uh, led in the Middle East by Saudi Arabia, uh, led in Africa by South Africa and Nigeria, which are half of Africa's uh, economy, and then led in Latin America by Brazil. And I think we're going to be looking at a fairly unstable world in the next 10 years when we try to find this new system. And I guess my message to Europe is that if we want to win this battle for the hearts and the minds and souls of the global south, we need to change our behavioral pattern. I think we're way too arrogant. I think we assume too much. We do monologue. We do conditionality. We don't do dialogue. We don't do real cooperation. Um, and in the next, I think, few years, we'll see a lot of these smaller regional and local conflicts emerging. The one big one that we've seen, of course, Ukraine, Russia. Now we're seeing another possible big one which is localized so far between Hamas and Israel, but could uh, escalate. So this is the world that we are in. It, it's a dangerous world, but I'm still hopeful that we find solutions. Sorry for the rather extended answer, but I think your introduction was extended as well. So. <laughs> no, it's great because actually you sum up a little bit all the questions that I'm going to, to ask you later. For example, the, this global south you're speaking about. Yeah. Um, in, your, in your introduction to your book, you also said that our, uh, the alliances today are fluid. Some are based on interests, exactly. others are based on values. Uh, I imagine that the EU transatlantic partnership are based on, on values. What do you think about this global east and global south that you spoke about? Yeah, I mean, and also I should probably be on the record, I, ha I haven't published the book yet. I mean, it's almost there, but there are reasons why I'm not coming out with it yet. Um, it's sort of a, um, I've been working on it for three years. It's very much the product, product of my soul. And uh, you talked about the practice, it actually starts with a text message exchange with Sergei Lavrov mm -hmm. uh, three days into the war. Um, now, what do, I, what do I think the base case is? I, I think we're going to see the, so two things. One, we're going to see the regionalization of power, right? So that means that organizations such as the EU or the African Union or ASEAN are actually going to be quite strong because it's more about regional integration than globalization. And we, of course, have a tradition to do that, right? We've been doing it since the 1950s. And yeah, sometimes it looks a little bit messy and sometimes people get frustrated, but you know, we kind of muddle through. But the second thing that happens, and that's value-based, the second thing that happens are these sort of unholy alliances, which are cross-continental. They're not value-based. So let me give you a few examples, uh, the BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Of course, an abbreviation which was created by a Goldman Sachs chief economist, Jim O'Neill, in 2005. That has now been added on with six countries, with an additional, um, I think, 13 wanting to become members. W what's the glue that keeps these, I mean, Iran and Saudi Arabia in the BRICS, what's the glue that keeps them together? Nothing, except a rejection of the West. So we have to prepare for that. You know, why did Saudi Arabia join the BRICS? Well, probably because it wasn't allowed to come into G7. So, you know, th these are the types of unholy alliance. G20, nice. The African Union became the 21st member of, of G20. G7, AUKUS. Yes, there is a bind there between the UK, the US, and Australia, but nevertheless, the Quad, Yes, there is a, you know, value, but so we're seeing these sort of interesting alliances emerge. And, and that's why a lot of people say that, you know, the, the global politics is, is, is like playing chess. I, I don't think so. I think it's much more complicated than chess. I don't know, game go or something. You know, a lot of intuition, a lot of different types of movements all the time. And that's what we're going to be looking at, I think, uh, for, for the next 10 years. So it's, it's, it's interesting times for us who study international relations, who've been involved in international relations. Uh, and and I, don't, you know, I don't belong to the doomsdayers who say that you know, it's all going to collapse and it's not going to work. No, of course, you know, we're going to solve this. It's not a question of that. It's just that the tectonic plates are shifting at the moment. So it's, going, it's an advantage, let's say, to have a, a value, a, a base of value, let's say. Well, for us, I mean, but we have to understand that you know, history didn't end. You know, I, I was a Fukuyama kind of a guy. I, I thought that, of course, 1989, all 200 countries in the world have to understand that the best form of government is liberal democracy, 
market economy and globalization. I mean, that, that's, that's what it was all about. But then at some stage, perhaps starting with 9-11, we, we began to realize that, you know, perhaps the rest of the world doesn't think like us. Then we tried to, tried to export our former government through, through war. You know, in Iraq, for instance, it didn't work, did it? So, you know, I think you have to lead by example, not by force. Uh, and at the end of the day, eventually, I'd hope that a lot of people see that, uh, you know, liberal democracy is a good form of government. So, as you said, uh, Afghanistan is one of an example of uh, a failed attempt to export democracy by force. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, mm. It's like democracy is so deeply rooted that people are willing to die for it, and yeah. for the freedom, of course. Could this also be partially interpreted as a successful, um, yes. and then I, I yeah. will come back to this later, a dignified foreign policy, because this is the term that you use on the EU, a policy of leading by example. Yeah, just a little correction to come back. I think Iraq was a mistake, Afghanistan was not. Okay. Uh, you know, in Afghanistan, we were, to a certain extent, fighting a war of terror, and we can see what happened in Afghanistan when the West mm -hmm. left. You know, the Taliban came back. But in any case, that's not the point. The point here is Ukraine. And this is an interesting thing. I think the year 2022 was actually bad for dictators and authoritarian regimes. I mean, it wasn't zero COVID policy. wasn't exactly a success in China. And Putin's um, attack on, on Ukraine, I think was one of the biggest tactical and strategic mistakes in, in modern history. He thought he could do what he did in Georgia in 2008, where I was mediating peace with Bernard Kushner, uh, and what he did with the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. But he got three things wrong. One, he overestimated his own military. Two, he underestimated the Ukrainian military and Ukrainian resilience. And three, he underestimated uh, the unity of the West. And what he basically ended up doing went completely counter to what he expected. He wanted to Russify Ukraine. It became European. He wanted to split Europe. I've never seen us more united than we have been in the past year and a half. He wanted to split the transatlantic partnership. I think we're stronger than we were during the Cold War. He wanted to break NATO back to its original task of 1948. And of course, I'm super happy because the icing on the cake from the Finnish perspective, is that Finland and Sweden join NATO. So he failed miserably. Uh, and I think we should take joy in that, uh, even though the situation is tragic. Because now we're seeing a Europe which I think will be split for a generation to come into two. One is authoritarian uh, Belarus and Russia, isolated from the West, not the rest of the world, from the West. And on the other side, we see, well, the 47 countries that were in Granada, uh, in Spain, uh, the European political community. So, you know, it gives me hope. Uh, the world is a messy place, but democracy is, is still there, alive and kicking. Final point on this. I've been thinking about from the big perspective. You know, sometimes we talk in isms, right? And, and the, the, the only worry I have is that, you know, the First World War killed imperialism. The Second World War killed fascism. The Cold War killed communism, and I hope that Putin's war will not kill liberalism. So we have to be very vigilant in fighting for the European and Western values that, that we stand for. And that's exactly what Zelensky and the Ukrainians are doing for us at the moment. And in order to do so, you say that we should have, the West should embrace a more dignified foreign yes. policy. Can you explain better? Yeah, that? sure. It was, it was something, so, so this was something when, uh, you know, Nikolai Tsurinda and I were foreign ministers in the good old days. Um, uh, I, I, I talked about, I think, in, in 2010 or 2011, I wrote a piece in Politico. So dignified foreign policy for me means that you respect whoever you're dealing with. And there are people who say that, oh, you know, how can you talk about dignified foreign policy when you're dealing with dictators? Well, the truth is that, you know, the world is not a place where everyone uh, is a liberal Democrat dancing on green fields with peace signs and rainbows. We live in a pretty tough world, you know, and, and, and that means that you have to play ball with people who you dislike. You know, I, I had a meeting with uh, the late President Karimov of Uzbekistan. He was a dictator who basically boiled his opposition, killed them in hot water, and threw their bodies uh, in front of, of their families. 
Now, is it dignified for me to talk with him? No, but dignified foreign policy means that you approach another human being by listening to them, putting yourself in their shoes and start the conversation from that perspective, not by taking a high moral ground and saying, listen, by the way, I'm not going to trade or talk to you if you don't believe in the same liberal values that I believe in. And we need more dignified foreign policy if we want to get our message across the world. Now, it's easy for me to say that because I come from Finland. Uh, it's a rather inoffensive country. We've never been a colonial power, unless, of course, you consider that we gave Russia independence in 1917. But perhaps uh, that's pushing uh, you know, historical interpretation a little bit. But the bottom line is that you know, when we go to Africa, and we have a colonial past. It's a horrible colonial past. If we go to Asia, we have a colonial past. And that means that we have to behave in a completely different way. Because I understand those people who say that, listen, why, why, why should we support Ukraine? I mean, who are you to give me a lecture uh, on uh, sovereignty or independence or nonviolence? Look what you did during the colonial times. So, I'm calling for a little bit more humbleness, a little bit more dignity in the language that we use in diplomacy from the West. Some people find it uncomfortable because it means that we're going to have to have a conversation, say, with Saudi Arabia. But, you know, we can't solve global problems just by ourselves in our little cozy European sphere. We have to talk to dictators. We have to talk to authoritarians if we want to solve uh, issues linked to the combination of biology and technology, or if we want to solve issues linked to the energy crisis, or if we want to solve, uh, finally and most importantly, uh, issues linked to climate change. So a little bit dignity, a little bit humility would be quite good for us Europeans, I think, sometimes. Yeah, and uh, let's say in order to have a productive dialogue, you have to speak the same language, which we often don't. I, I, I saw one of your uh, uh, geopolitics with Alex lessons uh, with uh, about China, about what we uh, don't Tough understand one, yeah. about yeah. China. What, what is that we should learn about China to have a, a productive dialogue? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to, to meet President Xi Jinping twice. He was at the time vice president and I was, I was foreign minister. I went to Beijing, I think 2008 or 2009, and we were supposed to have a half an hour courtesy call, you know, the usual niceties with an interpreter. Well, an hour and a half later, you know, we left the meeting uh, sort of shaking hands and saying this was an interesting conversation. He wanted to hear about the war in Georgia and other things. Uh, and then out of protocol, when he came to visit Finland, he said, hey, I, I want to meet that young Finnish foreign minister. So him and I sat for two hours discussing world politics and technology. And, you know, I posed him questions about competition and why he didn't allow Google or Facebook or Amazon and so on and so forth. It was a good conversation. So that's my sort of take on, on China, fully realizing that, obviously, it is an authoritarian power. It is a power which is not going to become a liberal democracy. But it is a power that we cannot ignore. So... You know, if I were to simplify it, I really like the language that Ursula von der Leyen coined. In other words, de-risk, do not decouple. And now the Americans are using the same language. I, I wrote a piece in the FT in, in 2016, which I called, For uh, China, Europe is the New Africa. And I know it was a bit provocative, but the idea was that what China was doing to African raw materials, they were starting to do to European technology and IP. And I warned against that in 2016. And that was actually two weeks before the Americans informed the Germans that the Chinese are buying Aikstron, and Aikstron has military intelligence, so be a little bit careful. So I think we need to be careful, you know, how we handle tech with China, but don't make the mistake of comparing China and Russia. You know, the, the dependency path that we have with China is much bigger than what we have with with Russia, and don't make the mistake of comparing China and the U.S. to the Cold War. Because during the Cold War, the U.S. and, and, and the Soviet Union had basically no economic or technological dependency. So, you know, we need to live with China, and then it's a question of how we do that. And I, I, I'm a little bit afraid of, of the rather bullish language that we hear from the U.S. coming on China, and I'd be much more careful on that. And I know I'll probably get pushed back and saying, well, you know, you're going to make the same mistake as you did with Russia. Well, I don't think so. It's, it's a different kettle of fish. And may I just add, unlike Russia, China is not an imperialist power. 
It is a patient power. It is a power that builds walls. It wants to stay homogenous. Uh, it believes in its internal power and capacity to act. So let's not provoke China too much and, and let's try to cooperate with them. It's always a bit risky when you take categories from the past and try to yeah, yeah. to over rationalize the past. That's uh, exactly, I will get uh, to that uh, at uh. the end because I really like that. Um, no, something that you said in your first answer, of course, you mentioned what is happening now. In Israel, we have to talk about this because, yeah. of course, now our the focus is on the victims, the hostages, yeah. uh, or this family who don't even know if their loved ones are dead or alive, but this will have huge geopolitical repercussion. Uh, what's your analysis, especially on this normalization attempt? Okay, so, I mean, in the big picture, I think we always have three possibilities. One is competition, second one is conflict, and third one is cooperation. The problem is competition is good, but sometimes it can spill over into conflict. So we need cooperation to contain it. Right now, we don't have cooperative instruments to contain it. So the bottom line is that if the world police, the US, withdraws from the security market, as it has done, it is going to create power vacuums, and someone is going to fill that power vacuum. In this particular case, obviously, uh, it was Hamas. Um, what are the repercussions of this once it has been contained? First of all, hopefully it just stays local and doesn't become regional. That's the first task, I think, of Europe to, to try to mitigate and, 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 and de-escalate. And I'm not, you know, I, I, I think you know, Hamas should be condemned. I think mm -hmm. Israel has the right to protect itself, hands down, no question about it. But there is a bigger, I think, geopolitical game being played here. And then that is when we enter Iran and Russia. In whose interest is it to destabilize the Middle East? It is in the interest of them, of course, including Hezbollah as well. So now we're in a situation whereby the eyes of the world have moved away from Ukraine and are now focused on what is Israel going to do next. Now, if and when Israel is probably going to go <laughs> full on on this, uh, we're going to be in a situation where they will be breaking international and humanitarian law, and then is when the whataboutism will start from uh, our Arab friends, from Russia, from Iran, saying that, ah, you condemn Russia, but you don't condemn Israel. So it's very much a catch-22 situation, I think, uh, for us in the West and, and certainly uh, for Israel. So right now, I think de-escalation is the only thing we can try to achieve uh, and then try to contain it. But the problem I see is that there could be potential other hotspots popping up. So Sahel is one example. Um, I think uh, Nagorno-Karabakh has been an example of frozen conflict which has now melted and is hot. Uh, and then, for instance, Kosovo. So this is what happens, you know, when you leave power floating around, someone will go into that vacuum uh, and hit it hard. And this is why we need international institutions and rules and mediators to solve these kinds of conflicts. And, and there are too many, too many happening right now for my, for my liking. I, you know, we used to have one of these for 10 years, and now we have two simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I skip to this uh, dignified foreign policy, I jump on your second thesis, that is that uh, uh, the EU will continue to side with the US on most issues, but at the same time, it will increase its strategic autonomy vis-a-vis mm -hmm. uh, -vis China or other global players. Uh, do you think the EU is or will be successful in this endeavor, and in what should we uh, like align with the US and what in what should we differentiate? Sure. Okay, now th this is we're in danger zone now mm -hmm. because I live in Florence, 500 meters from Santa Croce where Machiavelli is, is buried, right? <laughs> so I'm a little bit Machiavellian on this uh, and by that I mean to say that I'm a firm believer uh, in the value cord that binds the United States and Europe together. You know, I've studied in the States, I'm an avid transatlanticist, you know, I love America, this is hands down. But at the same time, I do understand those who also want to stress the independence uh, of Europe to act. You know, so I have a little bit of a Macron in me uh, on this. Um, I, I can't say I'm a huge fan of, of strategic autonomy. Well, of course, it depends on how, how you define it. Uh, but, but for all intents and purposes, if I really simplify things, I think on most questions, values, technology, 
uh, regulation, military, geopolitics, we need to hold the hand of the United States. They are our closest ally. We depend on their security. We depend on their support, regardless of whether Biden or Trump uh, is in office. But that's for 75% of the time. 25% of the time, we need to play ball. We need to be able to have more autonomous decisions in global issues. There are going to be issues where we have a different line than the U.S. Uh, if, you come, if, if you boil it down to, for instance, trade and technology right now, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the CHIPS Act, mm. they are pure and utter protectionism. You know, they're just pure subsidies to uh, the American economy. They do not stand the day of light in the WTO. So again, you know, this is an example where I think we, we, we need to be quite, quite hard. Uh, there are going to be moments when we're going to differ, I think, on China. And I know that Macron was quite tough when he came back from Beijing. Um, okay, I, I think Macron shouldn't have said it, but someone else could have said it. He, he was actually right. So we need to, we need to play the, the geopolitical game here. And I know this is a, a slightly uncomfortable question for some, uh, because we're so strong in our transatlantic uh, commitment. But the world is changing, and I, I think we need to be uh, alert to this change. Okay, so to conclude on a forward-looking note, you like to say that we have a tendency to over-rationalize the past, over-dramatize the present, and therefore underestimate the future. What future challenges or trends do you think we are underestimating? Okay, well, I, I mean, it's obviously a big question to, to, to give a quick answer, but, but let me try. I, I think there are three megatrends that we need to deal with very seriously. One is obviously technology, and more specifically, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. generative AI, robotization, nanotechnology, but more specifically, the combination of biology and technology, because that changes uh, the economy the way in which you work, uh, politics, the way in which we communicate, war, the way in which we conduct it, and also, I think, science and the way in which we are in human beings. So that's a global good that we need to deal with together. We underestimate its power even though we talk about it. So let's be serious about it. Let's see what needs to be regulated, what not, and where we can cooperate. The second one is a classic, uh, climate change, uh, which is obviously then linked to environment, which is linked to energy. But there, uh, again, it's not a question of underestimating, but sometimes we overestimate our own capacity to get someone to do something. And I think, again, we are too judgmental towards the rest of the world mm -hmm. when we say that you need to bring down your emissions, where they can basically give us an answer and say, listen, your whole industrial revolution has been based on pollution, so who are you to mm -hmm. tell me? We need to regulate it, we need to finance it, and we need to innovate ourselves out of that. And the third one is actually demographics. And that's also a global good in the sense that the pin code of the world is changing. You know, it used to be in the beginning of the century, 1114. So 1 billion in the Americans, 1 billion here, 1 billion in Africa, and 4 billion in Asia. By the end of the century, it's going to be 1145, and the 4 is Africa. And if we combine technological innovation, climate change, and a demographic curve which increases the population of Africa and makes it younger and decreases our population and makes it older, somewhere we need to find a match, whilst at the same time a lot of politicians are crying foul about immigration. So a lot of challenges, but you know, I'm the eternal optimist. You know, human beings have a tendency to solve these problems. We have less death through war today, we have less deaths through pandemics today, we have less stress death uh, through famine than we've had ever in history. Uh, and I think this is a challenging time, but this is going to be a good century. Okay. Uh, I would like to pretend that I'm not seeing that time is almost over because <laughs> I have a, another hundred questions, but unfortunately it is almost over. So I would just like to thank you very much for this interesting conversation and for accepting to be uh, here with us today. I look forward to, see your, to reading your book, of course. Uh, thanks to the audience. And uh, now, Sandra, over to you.